Hi all. Uh, welcome to Geo Special Data Analysis Talk. And the speaker is Jiao Yu. Jiao Yu is a co-founder of Wear Robot Inc., a venture-backed company for helping businesses to drive insight from spatial, spatial temporal data and leads the engineering team at Wear Robots. Please welcome him. All right. Okay, folks. Uh, can you guys hear me from the back? Okay, nice, nice. All right, folks. Welcome to my talk today. So the title of my talk today is Geo Unleashed, How Apache Sedona is Revolutionizing Geospatial Data Analysis. So my name is Jia. So before we get started, let me just introduce a little bit about me. So I'm the co-founder of Whereabouts Inc. So Whereabouts is a cloud database platform for geospatial analytics and AI. And by the way, we are hiring. So I'm also the VP and the PMC chair of Apache Sedona. So Sedona is a top level project at, at, uh, at Apache Software Foundation. And I was a computer science professor at Washington State University before. So anyone here actually graduated from WSU? OK, no, I, I, I saw there will be someone from WSU. All right, anyway, so my research before was focused on distributed geospatial DBMS, database management systems, also database indexing, as well as geospatial data visualization. So I got my computer science PhD uh, from Arizona State, and I also spent time at Apple, Microsoft Research, as well as IBM Research. OK, now let's get started. So today, we're going to talk about data, in particular, geospatial data. So as per Azure, so approximately 80% of an organization's data has a location component, or geospatial component, or spatial temporal component, whatever you call it, right? So I believe you guys here, you know, you've, you guys from many different companies, and you have lots of data in your daily, daily life, right? So you probably do. Uh, didn't, real, didn't even realize that. So the data you are using on a daily basis actually have a location component in it. So this is just because, so there are a couple challenges for geospatial data. So there, right now, there are two challenges for when people use or deal with geospatial data. So the first challenge is people always underestimate the values of geospatial data. So you have lots of data but you don't know, you should put it in the right context. You should relate it to space and time. So you can draw more values from your geospatial data. The second challenge is, even if you know you have lots of geospatial data, you want to make sense of data, you want to get the most out of it. However, due to the massive scale of geospatial data, you don't have the efficient tools or scalable tools to help you analyze and process the big geospatial data. So today, we're going to talk about the f how we can address the first two challenges. So first, if you want to make sense of, of your data, of your geospatial data, you first need to relate your data to space and time. So if you do so, you can actually tell a real world grounded story about your data set use space and time. So for example, Suppose you have a database in your company, and you look at your database, there is a transaction saying that a customer bought a coffee. If you just look at this information, you cannot get much out of it. It doesn't tell you much, right? But if you relate it to space and time, so a customer bought a coffee at a Starbucks store at the intersection of I-90 and I-405 on Monday at 7 a.m. So this opens up a whole new different world for you. So you can do lots of things on it. You can do spatial temporal an analysis, hotspot analysis, traffic analysis, lots of different things you can do on the geospatial data. So given that, you probably realize so there are lots of geospatial data, and it is actually very useful. In fact, so here comes the geospatial data universe. In fact, lots of data you are using, they are actually can be considered as geospatial data. For example, telemetry data. So the GPS devices installed on your fleets, installed on your mobile devices, 
also road network data, also satellite images. So this actually is very large satellite images. Telecom data, right? Traffic data, residential maps, as well as mailing services. So your packages, right? So how you're gonna how how the drivers deliver your packages to different locations. So what are the delivering centers? What are the locations, right? So all this data can be considered as geospatial data, as well as the natural disasters, right? So the storms. So where, so when the storm will come? So where the storm will go, right? Where are the fires? So all this data. All these natural disaster data, they are also geospatial data. So, <clears throat> as you see, you can get lots of geospatial data from many different data sources. So, now you want to make sense of this data, right? However, the problem is th this data are very huge. Why so? So, the data you collect from your vehicles, from your mobile devices, from your Telecom data sources, so there are a lot. So nowadays we have over five billion mobile devices all around the world. So they keep generating GPS information through the sensors, uploaded to our servers. They're just huge. Also, the road network data, so the road segments, the streets, the addresses, right? So, for example, Open Street Map, so which is the data source that is the backbone. Of the the modern map services, so Open uh, so Google Maps, Apple Maps, they're all using some sort of information from OpenStreetMap. So OpenStreetMap has over one terabyte road network data, and not only that, so OSM data gets updated on a daily basis. Just imagine that it is just very hard to uh, to process, right? Also. Satellite images, the geospatial images you collect from satellites, you collect from your drones, right? So all this data also huge. So for example, NASA, you know, they have a couple of satellites running outside the world and monitoring the monitoring the status of the entire planet 24 by 7, right? So NASA has over 22 petabyte satellite imagery data. So this is possibly already beyond your imagination, right? So given this huge amount of geospatial data, how can we find a scalable and efficient tool to process and analyze data? So here comes, here comes a Sedona. So what is a Sedona? A Sedona is an open source cluster computing engine for processing large scale geospatial data. So I posted three links here, so you can check, check our website which is sedona.apache.org. And our GitHub is uh, Apache Sedona under uh, the Apache organization. We also, we also have a Twitter account, at Apache Sedona. So if you're interested, you can follow us to get the latest updates. Now, let me quickly go through the current status of Apache Sedona. So the figure on your, the figure on your right is the current contributors and users of Apache Sedona. As you see, they are from many different companies. So Amazon, Databricks, uh, JB Hunt, Mercedes-Benz, T-Mobile, Uber. So lots of big companies are using Sedona to make sense of their geospatial data in production. So I am the original creator of Apache Sedona. So we started this project as a, as a research project on my PhD study, so in 2015. So Sedona becomes mature in 2017. So back then, it was called GeoSpark. So Sedona joined Apache Software Foundation in 2020. And uh, so now, it has over 10,000 corporate users. It has 98 contributors on GitHub. It has over 1.4 thousand stars on GitHub. Last month, it had over 1 million downloads. Overall, our total downloads have, uh, have, have exceed 13 million. Also, the, the Python binding of Apache Sedona is ranked among top 1% most downloaded packages on PyPy. OK, now let me quickly go through the architecture of Apache Sedona. So Apache Sedona as a computation layer in the middle, 
So on top of Apache Sedona, you can connect to many different developer tools. For example, Apache Zeppelin, uh, Tableau, Jupyter Notebook, GeoPandas, R Studio. And uh, underneath Apache Sedona, it can run on top of many different co distributed computation engine. Apache Spark, Apache Flink, and uh, we're going to support Snowflake very soon. So Sedona also supports many different data formats, spatial data formats, GeoJSON, uh, Parquet, GeoParquet, WKT, WKB, GeoTIFF, so on and so forth. Also, you can run Sedona on different public cloud vendors, AWS, Databricks, Azure, Google Cloud, so on and so forth. So in, inside Apache Sedona, so we have this layer called Spatial Query Processing Layer. So first, it provides interface, programming interface, to the end user. It provides spatial SQL interface, Python, Scala, Java, and R interface. It equips with a number of different distributed spatial query algorithm. Also, it has spatial query optimizer to help you find the best algorithm given the, given the statistics of your input data set. So spatial query processing layer is built on top of this distributed spatial data set layer. So inside our spatial data set layer, we have spatial partitioning, spatial indexing, and also spatial data compression. So this distributed spatial data set layer, as I mentioned before, is built on top of distributed computation engine, such as Apache Spark for batch processing, such as Apache Flink for stream processing, also Snowflake. OK, so given this architecture, let's take a look at a few examples about how can we run queries, in particular spatial SQL, in Apache Sedona. So first of all, I want to ask you guys, who are fam any of you know SQL? Just raise your hand. Yeah, a lot. Almost everybody knows SQL, right? So this is like a standard has been out there for, for like four decades or something, right? So spatial SQL, probably you have never heard of it or never used it before, but spatial SQL is also a standard. So it is standard has been out there probably three decades or two decades or something, okay? So there are lots of systems, spatial database, implementing this standard to help users make sense of their data. So what is that? How can we use it? So let's look at this example. Now suppose we have a table. So this table is called New York City Taxi Trip Records. So it has the following information. So each row, each row in this, tab in this table is a trip record, is a taxi trip record. It has a license plate, uh, timestamp, pickup point, drop off point, trip fare, trip distance. So basically the information on our taxi trip. Now we also have a query window, a polygon, which indicates like this one, which indicates the boundary of the Manhattan region. Now, I have a spatial query. So I want to know what are the trips started in Manhattan, right? So if you visualize this query on a map, which is a map on your right, so, so this query window is just the red rectangle on the map. So we want to return all the taxi, taxi trip records that started within this red color rectangle. So if we write a spatial SQL, the query will be like this one. Select from where. So these are just standard, uh, standard SQL syntax, right? Now the difference is, so for spatial data, now we have one more spatial predicate called ST contains, called ST contains. So the ST contains take two inputs in this example. So the first input, is the polygon, the polygon, the boundary of the Manhattan region, right? So the second input is the taxi pickup points. So it is a column name in the taxi trip records table. So Sedona is going to take this spatial query and execute, leverage the power of the distributed engine, and then return you the points that are within this query window, OK? So this query is a very simple but very common spatial spatial query. So it is called spatial range query. Spatial range query. So what you give here is a range query window, a polygon. Okay? Now, 
Here is a more challenging query. Suppose we have two tables, right? Table one is a city table. Table two is a driver table. So the city table, it is very simple. It contains all the information on our city. So for example, we have Seattle, we have Bellevue, we have Redmond. So we have a geometry column. This geometry column describes the spatial boundary of each city. So in the driver table, we have three columns, the name of each driver and the location, which is the geometry column, the location of each driver. So we have two tables. Now, the question I'm going to ask is, so I want to find drivers in each city. OK? So how can we write this query using spatial SQL? Here we go. So still, the syntax is select from where, right? So in the from clause, it actually involves two tables, city table and the driver table. And in the where clause, it still uses st contains as the query predicate. So the difference is now this st contains take two, in, two columns as the input. So the boundary of the cities and the locations of the drivers. So this query is called, it, it is called spatial join query. It involves two tables and uh, we're going to join these two tables based on their spatial, uh, spatial property. Okay? Now we know this is a spatial query, but the question is, this query is actually very challenging. Why? In terms of time complexity. Okay? Just think about that. You are joining these two tables together. Suppose if, if you don't have any optimized spatial algorithm. So what is time complexity? It is n square. Right? It is n square. It is very slow, especially when it comes to big data, big geospatial data, especially when it comes to running in a computer cluster. So the n square complexity just will not work. Okay? So in Sedona, what we did is so we designed very highly optimized spatial drawing algorithm to optimize this particular query. So it can see it is no longer n square. It is very fast. It also leverage our spatial index techniques. So I won't get into the details of this our algorithm today, but I just leave the question for you. And I will give you some hints later on. OK. Now let's look at another query. So this query is called, I want to find my, neighbor, my nearest neighbors. right? Suppose we have a table like this one. We call it a restaurant table. So what it has is the restaurant name, right? It also has a location of each restaurant. So this is this this kind of scenario is very common in you know food food delivery company or Yelp, this kind of uh, food recommendation company, right? Now I want to ask one question. So please tell me the nearest twenty restaurant. And the screenshots on your right is actually a real screenshot I took from my Yelp app. Right? So this is a very common query. So you want to return the top k nearest neighbor. So how can we do that in spatial SQL? So you can write a query like this one and send this query to Sedona. So what happens is in the select clause, you have this uh, function called st contains. You calculate the distance between the restaurant and your own location. right? And then you sort the distance ascendingly, and you take the top 20, right? So this is like, I, I guess it is kind of very straightforward, right? But now, let me ask you another question. So what is the time complexity of this query? So you probably think, OK, so you have a like order by here. So that requires sorting, right? So according to our textbook knowledge, so sorting in the, if you write in your own computer, use a modern sorting algorithm, it is like on average a uh, log n, right? So if we run this query, run this query in this way on a distributed cluster, it simply just not work. It takes a lot of time. Also, it actually not needed. So in Sedona, we actually also implement optimized algorithm for this particular query. So it no longer unlock in. It runs super fast. Also leverage our 
spatial partitioning leverage our spatial indexing. Okay, so I will give you more details later on. So, okay, so a follow up question, a follow up uh, slide about the ST distance function. So he, actually, there is a problem of the ST distance function. You probably don't even realize. So how can we calculate the distance between two points? So here are two points, point zero zero and point one one. So if you if you want to calculate distance between these two points, very straightforward. Just use your Euclidean distance, right? So it is square root two of two, right? However, how about geospatial locations, right? Suppose we have two points like this one, right? So minus 74 something and 40 blah, 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 right? So these are the spatial points. How can you calculate the distance between these two points? Apparently, apparently you cannot use Euclidean distance. Why? First of all, so the the coordinates you see in this in this formula is actually longitude and latitude, right? So they are degrees. The unit of this longitude and latitude are degrees, right? Apparently, you cannot use Euclidean distance. Also, even if you manage to use Euclidean, Euclidean distance to calculate the distance, so what is the unit? What is the unit of the distance you get? So kilometer or miles, so they are not, they are not uh, correct at all. So in fact, as you all know, so Earth is a sphere. Also, it is not a perfect sphere. So how can we calculate the distance between two geolocations? So in Sedona, we provide a function called ST transform. So what it does is it transforms the, the coordinates from a degree-based coordinate reference system to meter-based coordinate reference system. And after that, you could use the ST distance to calculate the, the distance between two points. And this distance, based on what you choose, it could be kilometer, it could be miles, but it is something you can understand, you can use for other applications. So if we put this on visualization, basically we transform a degree-based coordinate reference system to a planar space, to, to the coordinates on, on, a, on a map, okay, on the map you see there. All right. Now, the data I have mentioned before in the past few slides, they are all points, polygon, this kind of thing, right? How about geo images? So these geo images, they're they are usually called raster data. So here is an example. So the image down there is actually a, is a satellite image of the entire planet you can get from NASA from, or from other vendors, right? So this image contains information of the entire planet. It is so huge, so usually when people store it, people store it in small tiles, okay? Small image tiles. So each image tile is probably a few kilobytes. So you can use a regular image viewer to open it and view it. So how Sedona stores this kind of data? internally. So we store it in a table format. As you see here, so each row in this table actually is a record of a map tail. So it first has a name for the tail name. It also has a column geometry, which indicates the spatial extent of this map tail. So which region this image tail describes, right? It also has this raster column, which actually store the data of this raster image tail. So it looks like this one. We store it as a 2D array. We also store the information of each pixel, each element in this 2D array. Given that, now let's look at the query for raster data. Suppose we have the temperature, the global temperature information of 2015. We also have the global temperature information of 2014. Now, I want to calculate the climate change between this one year. In other words, I want to calculate the temperature difference between these two big satellite images, okay? So 
logically, it should be very easy. So all we need is, so we use the temperature in 2015 minus uh, temperature in 2014, and then we got the difference, right? So you can actually do this in Apache Sedona, use two different queries. So the first query is this one. So of course, this is still spatial SQL query, right? Select from where. So in, this, in the where clause, you join these two tables, the temperature in 2015 and 14, by their tile name. And then you use this function called RS subtract. So essentially what it does is it subtracts value of raster image T, uh, T1 from raster image T2. OK? You can also join them together through their spatial attribute, right? You can join them by their uh, spatial attribute and use this predicate, st equals. So you simply check whether the two image, uh, whether the two spatial extent are identical. If they're identical, so they are considered as the same image, OK? All right, so we have, we have seen lots of spatial queries in Apache Sedona, right? Now, let's take a look at how Sedona internally process these queries. So the, the spatial query processing layer in Sedona has three major components, spatial query parser, query optimizer, and the query executor. So in the spatial query parser, it can actually pass, pass different spatial expressions, st contains, st distance, and rs subtract, right? It also introduced two spatial data type. First, the first one is geometry type. It includes point, polygon, length string, this kind of thing, multi-polygon. So Sedona support many different geometry types. Also raster type for storing geometry, for, for storing the geo image, the, the raster data, right? In the query optimizer, we support spatial filter pushdown, spatial function folding, spatial join algorithm planning, so on and so forth. And uh, in the spatial query executor, they support distributed spatial index, uh, distributed spa uh, spatial data compression, which is spatial serialization and deserializer. OK. Now, I'm go, I'm, although we don't have enough time, I'm going to quickly go through a few key optimization we introduced in Apache Sedona. So the first thing is called geospatial data partitioning. So data partitioning is a critical factor in a distributed system. Uh, it will significantly affect the query, perf uh, query performance in a distributed system. So what it means is that give a huge data set, you need to chop the data set to small partitions, and you need to send these partitions to different machines. So that way, you can parallel the query workload. So each machine can take a piece of the data and work on it, right? So in Sedona, we introduced this thing called geospatial data partitioning. The idea behind it is we want to partition the geospatial data based on their spatial proximity, but we also want to achieve load balance. So what does that mean? So it means that we want to partition, so the, it means that so the nearby objects, nearby geospatial objects, are going to be put in the same partition. And also, each partition should have similar size. So that way, each machine in the cluster can get a, can get a fair share, right? can get a similar workload. So if you look at this partition technique we introduced in Sedona, so we partition data by their spatial proximity. And if there, if there is a region has lots of geospatial records, it is super dense. So you're going to have smaller partition, uh, smaller uh, box to partition data. So this is how we partition data in Sedona. Alt alternatively, in Sedona, we also provide two other fun two other ways to help you to partition data. So one is Google S2 partition method. Another one is Uber H3 partition method. Although uh, we don't recommend that because they don't have good perf as they don't have good performance, and our our optimized spatial join algorithm are much faster than this. Now, I'm going to leave two questions for you. So, first, how to get this grid file? 
Now we know the idea, right? But how can we actually give a spatial data set? How can we derive this grid file to partition data, right? So that's the first question. Although I don't have to get, in, I don't have time to get into that, but I want just want to give you some uh, question. The second question is, how about the polygons? So the data you see here, right now they are all points, right? You can easily partition point, put the, put the point to different partitions, right? But what about the polygons? What if there are some polygons sit on the boundary, sit on the boundary of two partitions? How can you partition it? How can you send it to different, which partition you, you, it should go, right? So this is a question for you. So in Sedona, we have all this kind of optimization technique to handle all these kind of cases. Another technique we introduced in Sedona is the geospatial index, in particular, distributed spatial index. So in Sedona, uh, in a distributed cluster, we have the master machine, which is a purple one. We also have a number of worker machine. So the spatial index of Sedona exists on every single machine. So we build a small spatial index on each worker machine of this cluster. So this small local index could be R3 or Quartree. But they are very small size. They only index the data of its local partition. Another important feature we introduced recently into Apache Sedona, actually in Apache Sedona 1.4, we just released it a few months ago. So it is GeoParquet reader and writer support. So I believe most of you here probably already heard of Parquet format before. But if, if you don't know it, so here is a quick introduction. So Parquet format is a hybrid format that combines both row store and column store. So basically what it means is that, so given, given a big data, uh, data set, it first partition data, partition data by rows. Okay, for example, the first 100 rows go to a partition, the second 100 rows go to a second partition, so on and so forth. You partition the data based on rows. So inside each partition, it organizes data using the column store format to speed up the analytics applications. So basically, it means you store data by column. So all data of one column stay together. So in addition to the format itself, Parquet also introduced metadata in each partition, in each partition. So this metadata includes some, some concise index information, such as mean max information of each column. So this mean max information is going to help you to prune some partitions before you even load it into, into the mean memory. So GeoParquet, GeoParquet is an extension, is also standard, is an extension to parquet file. So what it does is it, it introduces the geometry type and the geometry column for the parquet file. And not only that, for the, this geometry column, it also introduces this metadata called bbox. So this bbox stored together with each column, also with each, each row group, each partition. It can also help you to prune data before you actually load the entire data set. So the GeoParquet format uh, become mature later last year. Later last year, I remember December, December something. So Sedona now supports GeoParquet standard 1.0 beta 1. So here is an example about how, why you should use this GeoParquet reader and writer in Apache Sedona. Consider this spatial SQL query. So this is the spatial range query you have seen before using the New York City taxi trip data. Right? So this is a spatial filter used as contains. So without Sedona GeoParquet reader, what happens is, so suppose your data is stored in, in Amazon S3, right? You run your, your cluster, your Sedona cluster, with Spark on Amazon EMR or on Databricks, right? You have to load the entire data set from S3 into your cluster. So this is super slow, right? So with Sedona GeoParquet reader, what happens is that you're going to only read the data that are possibly related to this query into your cluster, into the memory of your cluster, so which is super fast and reduce the, the time you're spending on read the data, you spend on uh, the data transfer through, through the network, 
right? Okay, so another component. Another component in Sedona is the geospatial data serializer. So I believe some of you probably have heard of serializer or serialization before. Serialization is a very typical technique when people transfer data through network, right? So when you transfer some in memory object through the network, you're going to serialize the data to a battery. And on the other side of the network, you're going to take the battery and re deserialize or to recover the original object. So for Sedona, what we do is that so we, we serialize the geometry to battery, and later on, we deserialize the geometry back to uh, deserialize the battery back to the geometry. So this is actually a huge bottleneck for, for geospatial data system. Right? Why? If you just think, if you, if your data type is just integer string, double, this kind of data format, so this won't be a bottleneck. But for spatial data, imagine that you have seen polygons, polygon coordinates before, right? So the polygon, the spatial boundary of our state, our city, they're just huge. It, a single polygon could contain thousands of different coordinates. If you don't have an efficient serialization mechanism. It will take lots of time for you to run this query in a distributed environment. So without this, it commonly could uh, it could take up to fifty percent time for regular spatial query on just serializing and deserializing data. So you waste lots of time. So in Sedona, we have efficient serializer. In Sedona 1.0 to 1.3.1, so we use our uh, our own geometry serializer. It, the generated battery is three times smaller than the uh, curio serializer, 20 times faster in terms of serialization, and five times faster in terms of deserialization. In Sedona 1.4, we introduced a new set of serializer for our geometry type. So it is up to five times faster than our original geometry serializer. So this way you can get rid of lots of overhead here. OK, let me speed up a little bit. Here is a quick performance benchmark. So we use Sedona on Spark, and we compare it with different competitors. So the first benchmark is actually conducted in 2018. So at that time, there are a few other, uh, a few other spatial uh, framework, spatial pro query processing framework on top of Spark. So we compare with them. And uh, this data set we are running on is 1.3 billion New York taxi trip data set with uh, 171,000 city boundaries running on four machines. As you see, many of them they run out of memory and cannot even finish. Sedona finished the entire query uh, in less than 10 minutes. And the original Spark took one day and still not finished. We recently conducted another benchmark. So we run Sedona on 8 billion OSM nodes which is around 1.7 terabyte. And join it together is, is the same, uh, with the same city data set. We run it on 10 machines on EMR. It takes about five hours to finish. We also run another data set, which is OSM rows. So this rows is the road in the United States, or in, in the entire world. Usually it is a long trajectory, very, very long, across many cities, probably across a couple of states even. So we run it, we use, Seven, uh, 72 million OSM rows joined with the city data set. It used three minutes to finish. We also compare Sedona with another popular library, Python library called GeoPandas. It is a single machine solution and uh, also help you to analyze geospatial data. So to be fair, we run this query on a single machine. So we run an application called spatial aggregation. Essentially, what it does is it aggregate these aggregate spatial records based on the location, based on cell ID, to find the hotspot. So as you see here, if you have a very small data set, so GeoPandas is very good. Here, I'm not shooting down GeoPandas. I'm just saying when the data set is large, GeoPandas is just not performed very well. But if you have a small data set, you can go ahead and use GeoPandas. So Sedona is a, has similar performance as opposed to GeoPandas, when the data set is relatively small, around you know, 1.4 million. But when the data set becomes larger and larger, GeoPandas soon run out of memory. 
but Sedona can still finish the, uh, the query in about, in this case, around 240 seconds. So Sedona, in this case, also leveraged the multiple CPU cores on the machine, on a local machine. OK, I'm going to quickly go through a few applications, a real use, uh, use cases in, in uh, of Sedona. So we, we get all these applications from the open source uh, community of Sedona. So IAG, so IAG is an insurance company in New Zealand and Australia area. So they use Sedona to analyze so which areas and routes are the most disaster prone. So based on the result, they can adjust their insurance premium. So they can charge a higher price for, for people who live in those areas, right? Amazon. Amazon, the last mail delivery team in Amazon used Sedona to, to, get, to answer how traffic and residential addresses change on a daily basis. This way, they can get a more accurate routes for their drivers to deliver the packages for you. T-Mobile. T-Mobile used Sedona to answer how are the population density geographically clustered. So this way, they can decide whether they need to build more you know, cellular towers uh, in different areas, right? Also, Mercedes-Benz. So they use Sedona to answer which area has have more traffic and more car accidents. So that way, they can investigate the reason behind it and also probably better design their vehicles, right? All right, so, so Sedona can actually integrate with many different tools, as I mentioned before. So it can be integrated with Apache Zeppelin in a notebook environment. In this case, you can run a spatial SQL on the notebook and also draw charts, maps, use Sedona. It can also integrate with Python. It can seamlessly work with GeoPandas Shapely. So you, if you have a GeoPandas data frame, you can send it to, you can convert it to Sedona easily. And if you have a Sedona data frame, so you can also convert it to uh, GeoPandas data frame easily. So this is, this is seamless integration. Sedona can also be integrated with Jupyter Notebooks. So right now, most of our users, they actually use uh, Sedona Python with Jupyter Notebooks. So we also have a few demo notebooks. So due, due, to, due to the time limit, I won't go through the notebooks here. But I'm going to share a slide with you guys you know, so you can run it. Uh, you can go back home and run it. So we host all the notebooks on my bander. So you can open up and play around with Sedona. OK, so let me just stop here. Do you have any questions? Thank you. Sure. So what this gentleman asked is, so as I mentioned, so Sedona support raster data processing, right? So he asked, so do we have any uh, performance, performance benchmark against these applications? So this is a very good question. So right now, I don't have the number right now. So we are still developing more and more functions for Sedona raster. So we are planning to run a new benchmark very soon, probably in the next month, to see how Sedona raster data processing uh, outperform other uh, competitors. But thank you for raising the question. Go ahead. Yeah, got your point. So that's a very good question. What this, this gentleman asks is, so I mentioned so Sedona support can interact with GeoPandas. What he asks is, so what do I mean by this integration? Does that mean so we can load the Pandas data into Sedona and export Pandas data, in, 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 export Sedona data to GeoPandas? Or we support GeoPandas kind of style, programming style, a programming API in Sedona? So the answer is, 
So we actually support both in the sense that so you can you can of course exp load GeoPandas data into Sedona and also export data to uh, to GeoPandas. On the other hand, since since the example since the example we are uh, giving here, so they are actually use Sedona on top of Apache Spark. So that means you know recently in Apache Spark they invest a lot on mimic the Pandas API in Apache Spark, right? So that means if you run Sedona on uh, PySpark, if you want to have some kind of pandas style API, so we can st still support that. But of course, we don't have special design on Sedona for to 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 mimic the the Geo pandas API 100% on our platform. Hope this answers your question. Yeah, so you get pandas part, but not the part. Yes, okay. yes. Hello. Okay, uh, so time is, I guess now it's like taking a break and we have lightning talks at four o'clock. So, yeah. Thank you.